Um, so the first item on the agenda is the a recap of this first special session. Courtney, do um, you want to give us just a yeah. rundown? Yeah, I, I, I emailed you guys um, ahead of time, but just to, to kind of revisit it, um, there was a short three-day session. There were just 24 bills that passed. It was pretty bipartisan, which is not what we are used to hearing <laughs> in our legislature. Um, but it was it went pretty smoothly under the circumstances. The real focus, of course, was on police accountability and uh, response to COVID-19. Um, and there were a couple of really technical fixes that were left over from last session that got um, you know prioritized. So yeah, it was. I don't want to say it was innocuous because big things were done, but they were pretty watered down by the end of it. You know, to cut, that's what we do in policy making, right? We have to compromise. So, um, the the COVID response omnibus bill passed, and that had a lot of things around um, the you know housing moratorium, um, that kind of stuff. And then in the police accountability uh, measure or set of measures, there was you know there were a, a few one few that we'd heard a lot about, like restricting the use of chokeholds and. Um, uh, the disciplinary disciplinary records issue for um, for police officers or you know law enforcement, and then the arbitration issue around um, kind of making sure that uh, with misconduct cases that it's harder to overturn them. Um, so that was all about it. It was mostly policy stuff. You know, everybody's now pivoting to the budget conversation, which is likely to come in the next month. I would say as a safe bet. Um, no real indication on dates yet, but all this, the swirling rumor mill as it is, um, is, you know, sometime in late July, early August. So I'll keep you guys updated on, you know, as I hear more, but the big issues for us are going to be preserving the state school fund, which we're getting indications from the governor's office that, um, she wants to preserve the 9 billion, which what, is what we're budgeting toward anyway. Um, and then the questions become around. You know, what does it cost districts to reopen? What additional funds are coming from the federal government? Which is one of the reasons that the special, the second special session is coming later is because Congress hasn't acted yet on any additional stimulus. And so um, everyone's kind of waiting for that nod. And there's not a lot coming out about that yet. I mean, there's obviously the HEROES Act in the House, um, but everybody knows that things that are coming out of the House are often DOA in the Senate without a lot of adjustments. So we shall see, but I feel confident that the legislature is going to do something on budgets um, in the next month. So, so the timing is contingent on federal action. That's what I've heard. I mean, that's a lot of it. I think there's been the, the focus, the, the punt to later and not doing it all at once is rel related to um, what we were hearing from the feds, which was it wasn't gonna happen before the July 4th recess, because they always take a week off. So um, now that we're after that, I think we'll start to hear more about timing, but again, your guess is as good as mine is in terms of when the when Congress will pass additional stimulus, but that is the conversation that's happening right now. What does that look like? Do just, you know, what do local governments get out of there? Um, if anything, I, I I know that our federal delegation is pushing on that. We've, you know, we have regular, I have regular communication with them, but um, so does every other district in the country. Everyone wants more support, not just Portland. So it's helpful that we're all singing, um, you know, speaking from the same playbook, mixed metaphors. Um, well, we're in the era of Hamilton, so singing from the same playbook is probably the appropriate metaphor. Um, yeah, I've been singing the soundtrack all week. <laughs> I'm guessing you're not alone. Um, so I'm curious about how people think they're going to preserve the $9 billion state school fund. Well, it's it's. I think where I think there's an understanding that in order to do that, there will be have to be some tapping into the uh, education stability fund. It sounds like the governor is okay with that. I know that the speak I was texting with the speaker last week, and she was confirming that that is that number is what we've been budgeting for towards. Um, so it sounds like there is support for that from where we need to have support. 
but how much are they talking about taking from that? And are they thinking about the projections that this downturn is going to have a long tail? I don't know that level of detail. I know that Claire is participating with um, the other, what we call 10K or 13K school districts, the other big ones, to, to um, think through all of this. And also on top of that, think through reopening costs and what that really looks like, because that's a piece of this. It's not the same bucket, but it's all related to funding schools and how that looks. So I don't know the dollar amount from the st stability fund. All I know is what I've been told um, from various people around um, the 9 billion number. And that seems pretty safe at this point based on conversation with conversations with ODE and with COSA. And we have regular conversations with them about all of this. So are you hearing in those conversations, are you hearing people talk about, you know, we got to think about this in the context of the next two or three years as well? Like if we blow the whole. We're not, no, 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 no. So let me be clear. And again, I don't know numbers. There's no, um, nobody is talking about tapping heavily into the reserves to get to 9 billion. Okay. And there is a lot of, you know, that, that is, you're not alone in being concerned about that. Everyone knows that we're just in the beginning of all of this and that we need to, you know, we, we can't just go spending all of our savings as, you know, in, in other words, <laughs> um, before we know what, what we're dealing with. And I have not heard anybody wanting to just blow through it. Okay. So um, we'll keep, I'll keep you posted on the numbers that I hear, but okay. I have not heard that anyone is, is uh, eager to, uh, to dig too deep into that. Okay. Okay, I, I think I need constant validation that other people are as pessimistic as I am. So just I think I go. think that everyone is concerned about the future. And we need to yeah, be smart indeed. about it. Okay. Um Nathaniel, uh you're gonna have to I know you have to leave in a minute or three minutes. So do you have any questions or anything that you want to say before you leave? Um, don't believe at this moment. No. Okay. Thank you, though. You know where to find hey, me, Nathaniel. Um, Nathaniel. Nathaniel. Uh, yes. This is Amy. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm on the phone. Um, I just wanted to reiterate. Um, you know, Andrew brought up the other night that we've been approached. He was informally approached by the city about somehow collaborating on some of these renaming activities around buildings or programs and i think our approach as a district is to just support those efforts as they come forward led by students and um, community members but i just wanted to kind of restate support to you and to the dsc um, as far as those renaming efforts go and um, you can i know Yanis is primed to work with you guys and just be sure to ask for what you need or what you think people need to support those processes. All right, thank you. Yeah, it's good to hear. Okay. Um, They're happening. Amy, did you have any questions about the two sessions? Um. I don't think so. No, I kind of been checking in on that and no, I appreciate the update, Courtney. No problem. Okay. Um, okay, so do we have a, um, so looking ahead to this second special session, um, do we have an agenda? Um, is it going to be, do you know if it's going to be anything other than budget? No idea. Okay. Yeah, there's not a lot of information right now other than it's likely. <laughs> I wish I knew more, but it's it seems like, you know, if the information is slowly, tr slowly trickles out lately from there because there's all these conversations happening on Zoom and on the phone. And there's not a lot of, um, and I'm, I'm not trying to be critical, but it's hard to have public, a lot of public discussion right now. 
because of the virtual world we're living in. And so a lot of these conversations are not happening with people like me in, in every room, which is fine because it does leak out. And we, we also have access to our members. It's not hard to get information, but a lot of them don't even know. They're, um, I think everyone is um, doing, the, doing the best that they can under the circumstances and trying to like orchestrate it before they share information, you know, deliberately. Do, do we, meaning PPS, have a, um... Are we pushing for anything? Do we have an agenda? The only thing that we have been public about, and I shared it with you guys a while back, but we've been pretty clear that any budget decisions and discussions need to be centered in equity. Um, we sent a letter back in May, kind of, kind of assuming there would be more of a budget discussion earlier, but the letter is still relevant. Um, and it's, you know, it was written with the hope that other districts would sign on and they did. Um, and so that was shared with leadership to just underscore the need to really be thoughtful in how we make decisions um, because, you know, our students of color and our students that have, are homeless and all of our folks who are really struggling are um, gonna be struggling even more and it's exacerbated by all of this. So we just wanted to make that point if it wasn't clear enough. Um, so that's that's been our main focus um, and figuring out, and, and, you know, obviously the Student Success Act and, and thinking about, um, you know, we, we we have based our kind of our numbers, our budget numbers on some dip in that uh, in the tax coming in the incoming um, revenue. So I think we're feeling okay about that right now, um, and that's more of a clear conversation. But um, there is still a commitment to the Student Success Act, and it's just going to look a little different coming going forward. But it's still, you know, to be an optimist, it's still new money. And it's dedicated. So that is um, you guys, this morning I participated in our um, re-entry um, work group call, mm -hmm. and they're finalizing the blueprint for submission to ODE, and of course our own plans. I mean, the the what's required by ODE is um, much less intricate than what we need to do to successfully. Reopen, but one of the things, one of the questions I had and conversations we had was that um, I was asking Claire if they were specifically tracking costs related to um, yes. COVID um, for reopening. And for example, you know, there's there's operational things like janitorial services and cleaning supplies and all that. But there's also specific things within the ODE blueprint requirements, like mm -hmm. how you need to serve. Um, medically fragile students, that's just one example, but there are a lot of, um, you know, very specific requirements. And so her answer was yes, that we are really tracking exactly what those costs are. So I, I want us to be very vocal we, yeah. in expressing to the legislature what the cost of doing business in this new environment is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's a really good point, Amy. And I've been in touch with Claire about, you know, trying to get specific numbers because the sooner I can get specific numbers, the sooner we can, you know, run around and figuratively run around and let our delegation and others know what that number, what what that what the reality is on the ground and not just it's going to cost more to do business differently. They need to see numbers. And I know that, you know, our other kind of counterparts in other districts are thinking about this too. And I've been, I have a weekly call with uh, folks in the, you know, in the metro region, and it's on everyone's mind and we need, to, and, and collectively we are there. We just need, we need a little data to support it. Well, the other good thing too, is that since the big five school districts are collaborating on this mm -hmm. and they're actually, they're actually structuring their reopening plans in the same way, like the same work groups, the same way of breaking down activities. Yeah. Um, it'll be really easy for us all to collectively provide that because I think we need to assume that we're going to specifically request reimbursement yep. for all of those additional costs. And a lot of them are, are just, there are disproportionate additional costs for our highest need students. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's very, it's very true and um, top of mind. So um, I'll, don't worry. It's on my, it's on my list constantly. 
to check in and, and get closer to those numbers. So I'm I'm guessing that transportation costs alone yeah. are going to be what double probably. I don't know. If you can only have half a bus full of kids. It... Well, and it but it depends on whether there are some families that decide to just transport their own kids. And there's a lot of unknowns. I, I mean, I think we could all make a lot of assumptions, but we really don't know. And so, you know, everything is based on assumptions at this point. Right, right. But I mean, it's if, hard. If, if I were running the state budget, I'd probably, I'd probably have to assume that transportation costs are going to double yeah. and are they still going to stand by the 70% reimbursement rate? Yeah, I haven't heard anything different on that front, but, um, but the transportation, uh, the increase in transportation costs is very, it's a very common refrain right now. Because yeah. no one really knows what it's going to be other than it's going to be bigger. Different labor groups are talking about hazard pay too. Mm -hmm. And back to transportation, um, you know, yes, to additional costs, but the other consideration there is that our, um, most of our, many of our drivers are in high risk groups. And I think there's an assumption that we won't be able to fill the positions that we need, especially if we need to expand. Yeah. Okay. So, Courtney, the bottom line is we don't want anybody to think that we can just do this based with our uh, that's the message allocations, let alone our reduced allocation. Eight point whatever that we got from the CARES Act is like, yeah, okay, that's great, but that's not going to cover it. That's only four times more than Kanye got from the CARES Act. <laughs> oh my God. Um, okay, so Way to keep it light, Amy. <laughs> um, okay, so will, will you keep us posted on on you know as you read entrails? Can you yes. just keep us posted? Yeah. Um, and if there's any, you know, it may be another letter. You know, once we get a little better handle um, another joint letter for, with the other districts that we're working with to say, hey, this is no joke. This is going to cost us X or, you know, a range. Which is more likely to be a range and then, um, you know, because that's a good way to communicate right now. So, um, in terms of reopening beyond the state. Um, are we talking to any other local entities? Um, so my understanding is that we did not apply for any any of the COVID money from the city. Is that true? There wasn't an op. I'll give you a little sense of what they were dealing with. So I got to go back to my notes to make sure um, I'm giving you the right numbers. But basically. After the way that it all came down, the county, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the issue with the county dollars, um, but because because Portland is in Multnomah County, right? And the way that the CARES Act dollars were going out to local governments, cities and counties qualify for population population based allocation. So if you have 500,000 people or more, you get a certain allocation of the of the, that do those dollars. Then the treasury, they didn't want to disqualify counties with large cities within them, us being a good example, Milwaukee, those kinds of places. So if you're a county with a big city, they calculated the allocation based on the remaining population after you took that Portland out. So all of that to say, the way that the money broke down, Multnomah, to give you a sense, Portland got 114 million, Washington County got 104 million, Multnomah County got 28 million. So I think, you know, from what I heard from the city, because of the, basically the, there was this focus on getting some of those dollars to Multnomah County. And so once you start doing dollars to Multnomah County, dollars to East County cities, dollars to emergency operations, it was going really fast. And when I talked to them, they kind of laughed at me. <laughs> well, I won't say they laughed, but they were like, yeah, there's not, like, there's so much need and, and people, you know, the money's basically spent. So. I just wanted that um, 
reality to set in a little bit because it's not like they're just rolling in CARES Act dollars that they're going to start distributing to us. Um, it's a good question worth asking, but you know, and maybe there will be an opportunity at a later date, but it does not seem like um, it, it's not a priority to also then share it with the, the district because there were all these other priorities that they had to get it out to, including some, some grants for um, technology and those kinds of things. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention back going back to the legislative um, session, going back to the legislative session, there was, do you remember the rural broadband bill? And, and I told Scott there were very, there were very few opportunities within that because of just the, the sheer need in, um, in areas that are just not covered at all. But there was a second bucket that we learned about pretty late um, around COVID response. Like, so there was the, you know, expanding access issue to rural areas that don't have any. So that was the big part. But there's also a little bit left, um, a second piece that we could apply for if you wanted um, to respond to the crisis. So we found out about that and we were able to get an application in before the deadline. So Don worked on getting that in before, um, I think the Thursday was the deadline. So that's good news. I don't know what we'll get, but you know, there was, they were, they want, they need to get that money out the door. And I think we're, we're you know, in a good position. Good. So we'll definitely good. keep you posted on that. But um, so that was helpful. I mean, you know, every little bit, right? Million here, million there. Pretty soft. Pretty soon, you're talking real money. <laughs> Only a few more zeros to make it real. Exactly. Um, um, and Rita, back to your initial question about coordination. Um, the only piece I know is that Leslie Odell is working really closely with the county and fund program on um, childcare options, both for our families and for our staff. Yeah, and we um, we also I've been talking with Leslie and Emily and uh, and Nancy Howe about that as well, and kind of trying to, you know, go to every source about it. And we um, we were able to prep the superintendent yesterday just because he he's got a call with Chair Kafori coming up to check in with superintendents, and we wanted him to be prepared to talk about that if if it came up and to bring it up. Um, so we're trying to hit hit it from all angles because that's a real concern. Um, I also mentioned it to Lindsey Caps on a call last week um, so that we can get on the phone with him and, and his deputy to talk further about how we can push on that a bit. And, and is there, you know, there's sort of multiple multiple layers. There's a, a space issue around like just having a place to put kids. There's the licensing issue, right? Because right now the Sun program is not, they're not, that's not licensed childcare. And then there's the issue around, well, if we're only doing a hybrid model. You know, and, and obviously this is all still in flux, but the reality is likely. So, you know, then you all of a sudden you have a bunch of kids on a full day that don't just need childcare, they also need educational support. So it's complicated, as you know, um, and we need to partner and collaborate as much as possible. So we're just gonna talk about it with everyone we can to figure out how we can make it better. Okay. Um, not easy. No, it's a, it's like a Rubik's cube and I don't know if I can solve it. I mean, I can't solve it, <laughs> but I don't know if we can solve it completely, but we can, we can address issues as they come up and do the best we can and try to work with our partners to make it as, you know, to make it the best we can make it in the situation. Hey, Courtney, this is kind of a tangent, but, um, we have had some uh, uh, inquiries. Uh, amongst our board about um, meeting in person. Mm -hmm. So will you just um, give a little shout out to Rita and me or just, just check in with us when you see, if you see any other jurisdictions going to in-person meetings, I haven't heard. I know some small school districts in Eastern Oregon are doing it as far as school boards go and obviously the legislature did it and a lot of people thought that was extremely dicey, but just um, if you see something about like bodies reconvening just let mm -hmm. us know yeah i will um i know yeah i've been i've been hearing a lot of that too from folks who think you know if you're not meeting in person then why should we send your kids back so i can tell oh, really? you that washington county is meeting in person what'd you say stephanie washington county board of commissioners has been meeting in person for quite a while now 
That's the only one I'm aware of. <clears throat> yeah. Um, should we move on, Rita? Sure. Um, so I was going to give a quick update on some of the local regional stuff just um, for for your edification. And I think Julia is on as well. I know she has some information um, about some of these topics. So I know she was interested in sharing if I can't hit it all. But um, at, you probably read about, you know, everybody knows that parks is in really bad shape um, because they're based on people paying fees for things and nobody's going to anything. So. Um, there have, there's a council session on July 22nd where they're going to decide whether they're going to do a levy or a bond, um, an operating levy or a bond. So that, you know, it's likely that they'll be on the ballot in November. Obviously, that's, um, uh, that's, you know, it impacts our bond measure, but it's a, you know, it's a reality that we should just be aware of, um, especially because many of our families benefit from the services that parks offers and we have a you know a longstanding relationship with parks whether um, whether it's always positive I know we've had some concerns about um, share you know sharing space but we we enjoy working with them we want to make sure they're successful so I just wanted you to know that 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 conversation is happening at, towards the end of the month I, I did I did talk to the mayor about that about a week ago and um, one of the things we talked about which was kind of interesting is um, I made a plug for the recreation part of parks and recreation. Mm -hmm. And um, we talked about middle school athletics and equity and <clears throat> that if they're really um, going to lead with an equity lens on their um, measure that it would be, I made a real push for seeing some um, support for uh, equitable kids opportunities there, whether it's fee reduction or new programming mm -hmm. or, you know, collaboration and partnership with us. And he, he talks to talk about wanting to collaborate closely on that kind of stuff. That's great. Um, and then the other one, and um, I'll share what I know, which is not a whole lot. The transportation measure, I don't know if Julia wants to share anything that she's heard from her other perch, but, um, you know, that one is really, it's unclear to me what what's happening over there. Um, I don't know. First of all, I don't know if we're I don't believe we're exempt from the payroll tax. Um, the youth transit piece I mentioned in a previous email, Rita, um, that the youth transit pass would be is sort of predicated on the fact that we have a, a youth pass. And that brings the cost down for the measure, which was more palatable. This is my understanding. Um, it would also be phased in to, um, you know, to impact high school aged kids first, it's eight, you know, ultimately 18 and under would ride for free. Um, the question I still don't have an answer to um, is what happens in the months where, for example, you know, we're not a full year pass, we're a school year pass. So do our kids then get a free pass over the summer? And so it, it's, it gets into the weeds a bit, but that's a question we would want to know the answer to so as it relates to our students. Um, so I know I, I know you've given me an answer before, and I'm not sure that I remember what your answer was, but um, so the youth the, the PPS youth pass is not free to PPS. No, um, so, it's so the, way the, the way that it works is we, you know, the city's out. It's us and right. TriMet. We've had an idea the last two years with them. We pay 1.9, 1, 1. they pay a million. Uh, we get 70% reimbursement. So, no, it's not free to us, but it is significantly cheaper to do it this way because of the state support. Okay, I get that. Mm -hmm. um, are they going to be making the same deal with other school districts? That I don't know. I don't believe that's part of the plan. Um, but so, that, that's what I have a problem with. Um, yeah, I understand. And and I would like us to play a little bit of hardball on that. Um, and I understand that we have more money than other districts, but it's not like we we have deep pockets. Um, so, um, I I think equitable treatment would be in order here. Like if if we're gonna if we're gonna have to do cost savings, uh, cost sharing, then other districts should too. 
Um, I'll have to dig, I'll have to dig into it a little bit. This is a it, it gets a little bit complicated because of the way in which basically this isn't just for for high school students. It's going to be more than that. And I, I just don't, I'm just going to pretend, I'm just going to say it. I don't know enough about the why we got to that point um, with, with this measure. I got to dig into it a little bit. I haven't had the time, um, but I will. And I'll, I'll provide more information as I get it. Okay. Thank you. I reached out to Andy Shaw at Metro um, last week and I haven't heard back. This is Julia. For one thing, I think that measure is going to have, they're actually having a work session on it right now. Mm -hmm. As we speak from two to five today, and I actually think it's in um, big trouble because they're pulling um, of all the potential measures that are going to be on the ballot this fall. It's the one that has the lowest level of support, um, and they're going to have an active opposition campaign against it. Um, and so they're like, uh, just today there was a conversation about it. With the business community and they're still like wavering out like the number the, actually the, the percentage has gone way up I mean, it's, it's a huge payroll tax it's almost comparable to the climate tax um and like the impact on public employers because it's not just businesses and then it um it looks like they're not gonna be able to raise the amount of money they thought which we'll have to raise the, the rate anyway it's um when you look at the the seven potential measures on the ballot this fall, it has the lowest amount of support among voters. Um, and from our from polling that we've, we've done in my other life, um, it looks like voters are gonna like stick through and they're not gonna do the we're for everything or we're against everything. They're gonna be, and for PPS, this is a good thing. They're gonna be, you know, look at, at each of the measures and kind of weigh them, but they're not going to just do a full sale yes to everything. Uh, but the transportation one is the lowest. Um, after PPS, the, the, one, the second entity that has the most support for any of its measures is parks. And they're actually going to do, just to your earlier um, reference, Courtney, they're going to be doing um, a levy versus a bond because one of the things parks is it's sort of like Metro and that it's a fee dependent, well, it's very dependent on fee. So like all the community centers, um, all their revenue from that, they've all lost it. Um, and so if they don't pass the levy, I mean, this levy is really what's gonna keep parks afloat because they're not getting any of their community center revenue or their classes revenue, that's all gone. Um, so they're really focused on even though they maybe could pass a bond and a levy, just being able to have some programming at all. That's helpful, Julia. Thank you. Um, I, this is Amy. I talked to Lynn Peterson a couple days ago, and they're formally going to ask for our support as a board for the um, transportation packet for the transportation bill or the transportation measure and um you know leaning heavily on the um youth pass piece of it it also includes some money in there for um uh, affordable housing on transit corridors several of which in the uh, uh, the regional hubs are within our district i told her we had a pretty um tried to hew to a pretty narrow process around what we would endorse and that obviously our focus is on our own measure. So, um, you know, I was a little pessimistic that that would be forthcoming, but she sent a letter, I think actually just yesterday, and I'm sorry, I didn't forward it um, yet to you guys, I'm on the road, but um, just formally laying it out and asking for our support. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about community support, but I know that there's a fair bit of business support uh, lining up against it, which they had not originally anticipated. Yeah, it's just I think uh, the timing of it is like I talked to Preston Passports the other day, and they've laid off a third of their their workforce. Um, and just well, everybody I mean, like he's going to have layoffs. I mean, just it, it's a hard time to be adding 
new tax on. Or, and um, I think they're going to have a pretty substantial. Uh, they may not even refer it. Um, but I think, Amy, your response is the right one um, because. Uh, I think we do need to focus, focus on our measure, and it may be like, hey, individual board members um, can take positions on other measures, like people want, might want to take positions on the preschool measure or the library measure, and then the library measure is going to tie in nicely to the Jefferson Project because they're going to be doing the Albina branch. Um, but I think as a, as a group, um, it probably would be wise for us to stay laser focused on our measure. Well, I would also, I mean, if, if we're even going to contemplate um, giving uh, a, a board endorsement of the Metro measure, I would need to see some benefit to us. I mean, for the youth pass, it just sounds like we're going to do what we're doing now. So there's no real benefit there. And on the housing, are they going to be working with the district to coordinate um, location of housing in terms of, you know, school, school facilities and all that? Um, well, I'm sure they're working with the Population Re Research Center at PSU to figure out where those places will be. Well. I would hope so, but I don't think there's any guarantee. I mean, I have, I've been asking about what level of coordination is happening around planning for housing and um, in schools. And I have not heard anything that gives me great confidence that any of that is happening. Well, and just for what I've heard, they're, they're just Rita, to your point, they're, primary project that they're looking at is the, uh, the south quarter that goes to Bridgeport Village. So it's not even really a, like their primary project is focused on connecting down to Bridgeport Village. And they were saying, because there was a conversation about um, housing and how it fit into the larger uh, plan and one of the things that Andy Shaw had said was that they, you know, what they, one of the things they found is that while you've had some economic development, you've also had displacement uh, because you put in, for example, light, light rail line and um, property value increase and just makes it more challenging for affordable housing. Anyway, there's a lot of dynamics that if we were to take a position, we need to know a lot, right. a lot more. But I think we should try and stay focused on ours just. Just like we don't go around to other entities and ask, uh, we don't like ask the Multnomah County Commission to support our measures. We ask, you know, Deborah and Jessica and you know individual members, and it's just easier that way. And seems like might be a good thing for us to do as well. Um, I know Rita, you haven't had. I think you are you getting your polling briefing tomorrow? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we. We have a we have a path, and um, but I think you know, just in uncertain times, well, we should not take anything for granted. Right. Because I right. think everybody's going to want to affiliate with us because we have the easiest measure to pass. Because it's not a new tax, unlike everybody else's. Right. Okay, um, should we move on to the next one, the Rose Quarter project update? Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. My dog's going nuts. <laughs> the joys of working from home. Um, so, yeah, so Rita, last week there was a lot of activity on the I 5 project when the Albina Vision Trust folks backed out of the project and pulled their support. Um, and quickly thereafter, the mayor and Chloe Daly's office pulled their support as well. Um, Jessica Vega Peterson as well. Uh, and I think Metro's looking like they might too. Um, so we wanted to have this, I, I wanted to have this conversation because I think we need to 
strategize on what's next for our role in all of this. But I want to be really clear, and I, I did, I think, send you an email to this effect, but we've never supported it. We've been neutral. We've been trying to get the best situation for our school and been, we've been laser focused on Tubman and the role of, you know, the that building and all of this. Um, so I'm, I have concerns about us backing off completely because I think this is a really opportunity, good opportunity right now for us um, as it relates to that school. And so I just, I just wanted to have that conversation and get your thinking around it, um, all of you. So, um, I mean, my, my thoughts are this, I sort of um, parallel with yours, Courtney, and that they, um, we never, unlike the city and the county um, and lots of other entities that, you know, actively lobbied the legislature for this. I mean, this is a huge project that they got behind. Um, so I think when Albina Vision, which, you know, had hadn't been a, it never like you know this is our project or lobbied for it but they made a decision that we, they weren't going to engage anymore and i think at that point the city and the count the county were in a position of they had actually been very strong active supporters and you know felt they needed to do something to indicate that their position was different like i said i think from pps's standpoint um i don't think anybody would ever describe our our position as like, hey, we are one of the primary advocates. I mean, I think we are viewed as sort of somewhat obstructionist. Um, and it's not clear what is going to happen with the project. So I, it, I think it, uh, it would be good if we waited to see what happened, uh, what happened because there is this increment of money. I think it's like now six to seven hundred million. Um, like, mm. is, is the legislature just going to say, fine, screw you guys? We're going to, um, I'm sorry, it might just say, fine, Portland, we're going to um, send that money out to another, like, suburban district that wants it. If you guys don't want the money, we'll just redirect it. But it's not, it's not clear that that's what they're going to do. So um, even if the city out and the county out, they may still um, decide to proceed because that money is earmarked. Um, and... They, there is, and I think the, a dynamic that would be good for us to hear from is from the minority contracting um, group because Nate McCoy and Alondo Simpson, who is the head of the executive advisory group, have been, you know, very strong advocates of the project. And I think they have been doing a lot to try and bring, you know, Alpine Vision and the minority contracting um, community in together because this is, you know, potentially a win for Albina. So I'm sure it was disappointing for Albina Vision to, to pull out. Um, but it seems like PPS, we're not in the same position the city and county were, and so I don't think we should feel compelled to do something right away. They were pretty exposed because they had been pretty, pretty far out there, but um, it, it seems we may still want an unlocked for Tubman, and that may be still the way to to do it. I, I didn't hear that. We may still want to what for Tubman? There may still be an unlock of funds for Tubman um, through the process. Um, or what does that mean? Pardon? What does an unlock mean? What does that mean? Like, I mean, Scott and I from the very beginning put on the table, like, you should pay to move to school um, if you're going to. I think if she's out of cell phone range, I can pick up what she said from the beginning. There's, there has been a clear, like, you could just pay to move the school. Essentially, if the, if the project goes forward, um, which it, it's, you know, still potentially could, you know, do I we don't still think want there's... to protect those two assets? I think we, we've got that asset. And Courtney, I agree with your general orientation of just to watch and wait um uh attitude here um and just pay close attention i mean you know the interesting thing with the whole fulfillment of the albina vision trust 
plan is that many years down the road, if their development schemes come to fruition, that that property where Tubman is um, could be some of the most valuable property in the city. So, um, you know, I think we, I think, or, or if they owe that real proceeds, you know, maybe we see if we can get top dollar for it. But I think, um, you know, this is pretty peripheral to our, um, our mission now, and there's nothing immediately um, at Jeopardy, which was our why we got involved in the first place, because we were concerned about the health and well-being of our kids. Um, so, Courtney, you're you're on point to to tell us when we need to start paying closer attention. But until then, we focus on um, you know what's what's more yeah. what's more important. Yeah, and I had a really good conversation with Brendan Finn who's the new um, director of the regional, the mega projects office at ODOT, who used to be with the governor and is spearheading this. Um, I had a good conversation with him last week. And um, so that's an ongoing, uh, you know, we didn't, there were no decisions or any, hey, yes, we'll give you all the money. <laughs> but I think he understands the sort of the moment we're in. And I think if anything's gonna change, he's gonna be a part of that. And so I, I will keep talking to him and, uh, I, I'll keep you posted on what I'm what I'm learning. I mean, I think he was as blindsided by the activities of last week as any of us were. So um, I, I think he's he's trying to figure out how to how to keep this thing moving forward. So I will I will keep talking to him. Okay. Um. Okay, can you keep us posted as things develop? Yes, I will. Um, okay, so the last item is on a, a, a federal update. Is there anything to update us on? Not much other than what I already told you, which is, you know, there's the reason that we the budget session got pushed is to kind of wait and see what the federal government decides to do um in terms of a an additional stimulus package um i don't know what the timing of that is i just know that they are back after the fourth of july recess and that uh now is when those conversations are happening so i'll continue to let you guys know what i hear um i i can't even say <clears throat> i'm optimistic that there will be another one I, I i feel like i would be surprised if there wasn't i just don't know what it's going to look like i mean the you know, the house is doing their thing, but like I said, it's a very different environment over there. So just because it passes one chamber doesn't mean it's gonna translate in the Senate um, in the same way. I mean, obviously it won't be the same, but. I, I talked to Congressman Blumenauer last week and he, his assumption is that the current package is DOA in the Senate, but that the house is going to take another crack at something um, that has a better shot of mm -hmm. um, getting through the Senate and that there is some appetite in the Senate um, even to specifically to include um, public school support. So um, they Good. are going to take it up again. Good. Okay. Um, I don't think any of us should hold our breath on that. But um, fingers might be crossed occasionally. Um, but back to the beginning of our conversation, Rita, the good thing is um, it'll be a lot easier to advocate when districts are able to to express exactly what their costs are. Right, right. Or that it, which are we're so much closer to now with reopening plans taking shape. Right. So can I can I ask a um, I mean, this is driven by tweets, so I'm, I'm, I just feel compelled to ask. Um, is there any, um, so the Trump administration is weighing in now about school reopening. Have you heard anything about that? It, it, does, it, is that going to have any legs? Is that going to? You know what I mean? Or do they have any jurisdiction? No. No, I mean, states are going to do what they're going to do. And he's just, I mean, I, 
this is all I have to say. <laughs> I'm just, I, I'm, it's a lot of noise right now, Rita. Um, I think we're going to continue on the path that we're on. And um, I'm frankly, I hope we ignore it. Okay. But yeah, we'll <laughs> it'll depend on what state, you know, I think it's going to depend on, it's going to be state by state. Like it always is. Okay. Um, well, hopefully. Anyway. Um, okay. Is there anything else that that you wanted to update us on, or you'd like some? No, I, not at the moment. I think you know. I it's there's a little lull right now in between sessions and i mean i know it's not there's not a lull at the district it's a busy summer um there's a lot going on but in terms of all the things we've gone over today i mean right now we're just waiting for more information i feel like it's a wait you know hurry up and wait but i'll i'll continue to update you guys as i learn more and um if you hear something and and i'm not always the first person to hear so if you hear something and you don't think i know let me know. And maybe I do, but probably not. <laughs> okay. My ego is not that big. <laughs> um, I get it's not on the agenda, but I should probably ask just in case. Um, Kara, did anybody ask to do public comment? No. Okay. Um, anybody have any other questions or thoughts? Okay. Um, thanks, thanks all. I'm going to give you 34 minutes Not back. Right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thanks, thank everybody. you. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.